Hey, this video is just going to be talking about the append predicate and prolog and how the recursion works. I've been learning a little bit about prolog and recursion can be a little bit tricky, so if you're struggling, I hope that this video can help. We've got a knowledge base here on the left. We've got a base case followed by a recursive case. And our query here has two lists. And what we want to do is concatenate these two lists to produce this result. So the strategy is we want to take this left hand list here the first argument and when we recurse down we want to reduce this list to contain zero elements so it's an empty list then it will trigger the base case and then when recursion unwinds and heads back up we'll create the result by essentially taking each single element of the first list and merging into the second list but this still seems a bit abstract now um, so we'll start tracing it and hopefully it will become clearer as we get going. But in the interest of time, I've given these variables their values. So our goal is to reduce this list. In Prolog, we reduce the list by using the bar operator, which gives us access to the head and tail. The head is the first element of the list and the tail is just every element that follows the first element in a list. So there's only B that follows A, so B is put into its list by itself. And by recursively calling ourselves again using the tail, we end up gradually reducing the list after each recursive call. And in this append predicate, we don't actually do anything to list 2, so you can just think of list 2 as being um, exactly the same 100% of the time. And we just focusing on the first argument list here. So we recursively call ourselves here with just one element list in the first argument position. And then you can think of this as creating a new stack frame if it helps you visualize um, any previous programming you've done with other languages. So you create a new stack frame, new stack frame gets popped on the stack. These variables have their values initialized and what Prolog would do is, when it creates this call, it would first go to the knowledge base and start scanning the knowledge base from top to bottom and try and match or unify this term with a fact or a goal, a fact or a rule in, in the knowledge base. So this term wouldn't match with the base case. I'll explain a bit of uni unification in a second, but it won't match to the base case, so it will fall through and match the recursive rule. Therefore, Prolog will come in here and sort of execute the recursive rule again and create a new stack frame. And then we'll grab the head out, B, but since there's nothing after B, it's only one element, the tail will be an empty list. So then we recursively call ourselves again and we end up hitting the base case. So the way I normally do recursion is I sit down and just do like a simple example like we've done here and then do like a list reduction of some sort and then see if I can find a pattern and here it's like we run into an empty list so now it's like this is the time we actually start to focus on what we need to do with this empty list and this is where some of the magic in Prolog happens and if you've heard of the term unification it means that Prolog tries to make match two terms um, with each other to make them exactly equal as each other syntactically so this means that Prolog will look at this term and this term and it will ask itself is there a way that I can make these two things exactly equal each other so the way it does this is it comes into the first argument and compares the corresponding argument and then Prolog asks itself are these two arguments equal? Are they the same thing? If they aren't, is there a way that I can make them equal? But because T is an empty list and so is the first argument here they're both empty lists so Prolog is like okay cool these are both the same thing anyway so they're equal I can move on to look at the second argument. The second argument 
prologue list two has a list of containing one, two, and three. But this corresponding argument is a variable called a. And in prologue, variables have special meaning when the unification process happens. A variable basically can take on any value. So prolog says, okay, I've got a variable here called a. I know that a variable can accept any value. value. Therefore, to make these two arguments equal, all I need to do is take this value up here, the list 1, 2, 3, and shove it in a. So we can look at this a as having the value 1, 2, 3 now. Therefore, prolog's like, okay, cool. These two things are exactly the same. I'm okay to move on and look at the next argument now. Then prolog's like, okay, how can I, are these two things equal? If not, how can I make them equal? And these two arguments are variables because uh, they start with uppercase and they both don't have values yet. So in prolog, when when uh, unification happens between two unbinded variables, meaning variables that don't have values yet, Prolog creates a special relationship between these two variables, which means they end up sharing the same memory address. So if you're familiar with Java, it's the same thing as doing this. You create a person, and then you this person2 variable is an alias to the person1 variable, so they point to the same object in memory. So if you went p2.name equals Mary, now p1 has a name of Mary as well, because they're both pointing to the same object. And this is what happens here with Prolog. So in Prolog, Prolog's like, okay, cool, I'll unify these two variables together. And in this unification process, I'll create a relationship between them. And I'll make sure they share the memory address with each other. So we can just say that these two variables share the memory address ABC111. So I'll just clean clean up some of this mess here. So when prolog binds binds um, this second argument, so a receives a value of one two three, and because we've got another variable called a with the exact same name as this a, this means that prolog takes the value of this a and shoves it in this A. So now prologs they're both the same variable name, so obviously this A is one, two, three, and so is this A. So now prologs are like, okay, cool, this A here has a relationship with the result in um, the higher stack frame of the previous recursion level. So it's like, okay, cool, I'll just shove this in the shared memory address here. So now the upper level can see the result that I've just produced. So this is a way that Prolog gets around the fact that it doesn't have return statements like other programming languages do. So essentially the higher level stack frame can now see the result produced from a lower level of recursion because it's stored in this shared memory address. So now you can think of this stack frame as being killed off, popped off the stack, and now we come back into focus for this stack frame. And result is now binded to the list one two three and everywhere we see result we can just chuck one two three there to signify that this is what its value is and now we just need to evaluate what this is so to do this we just grab what head is which is b and then we can just write that out in full so b bar one two three and this is the next step of so bar has two different meanings when we have a bar here and followed by a list the bar actually can remove a list as well so we use the bar here to separate the head and tail but we can also use the bar here um, to remove a list that follows it which simplifies to just this without the inner list in there and this means that um, previously 
when we called append in this higher stack frame to this new stack frame, the there was a relationship that formed between the two unbinary variables in the unification process. So this means that when we calculated the final result here, Prolog's like, okay, we've got a relationship with the the next stack frame above us, so we'll just push our value into the shared memory address here so that the next level above can see that result that we've just produced. So basically we just repeat the same process. Every every we see result we just stick um, this value there to signify that this is what it currently holds. And then to calculate head, head is A. So again we'll just write it out A bar B one one two three and the bar followed by a list the bar removes the list so we can simplify this again two three and that's our final result that we've calculated and pretty much the same sort of story when we did the query and initially called the first recursion stack frame there was another shared relationship that occurred between these two and then once we calculated the final value Prolog's like okay I've got a relationship with the query this, the level above I'll just push this into the shared memory address so now the original query caller receives this value which is why um, on the console the result prints out as the final value so it sort of bubbles up from the top to the bottom and I guess the key point is that this um, be careful with the unification process between two unbinded variables that occurs in the recursion process that one level um, has a relationship with the level below it which is created through um, the binding of two unbinded variables that create this shared variable memory address here so it's a way for Prolog to um, have lower levels return a value to the upper levels and I have this other diagram here I'd just like to show that hopefully might make it a little bit clearer just to wrap up the video so what's going on here is that this is the query here and the result is this here but it's like it's a question mark it doesn't know what this result is yet and likewise as the recursion goes down we don't know how to build the result until the base case is hit so um, it's best to read this from the base case going upwards so when the base case hits G3 is assigned the list of 1, 2, 3 and then the next level above the base case now we know what G3 is it's the list 1, 2, 3 this means that we end up back in this situation where we actually um, have this this pattern here again which means that this simplifies to V1, 2, 3 so now we know so now G2 G2 equals B123 so now the next stack frame above knows what G2 is G2 is this and therefore we end up in the situation where we've got A bar B123 and the bar removes the lists etc and then we get into the the final result of this and now we know what G1 is so G1 therefore this the variable G1 in the query gets sort of instantiated to the actual final result which is what is displayed to the console so yeah just think of these as uninitialized variables which don't know their values until the base case hits and bubbles up to the top again so 
hopefully that clears up some confusion and if it's helped then I'm glad and hope to catch you next time.